cardiologist. So uh, I had the privilege to have a lot of patients who survived cardiac arrest. That is how it started for me. So I have, when I started to ask patients the question if they could remember something from the period of consciousness from clinical death, to my big surprise, there were quite a lot of patients who had this experience, what is called now a near-death experience, which is an enhanced consciousness uh, with self-identity, with cognition, with emotions, with memories from early childhood, with future events, with the meeting of deceased relatives, or experience a tunnel on a light, a uh, life review, or even the possibility of having perception out and above the lifeless body. So for me, what I had learned, it is impossible to experience consciousness when the brain is not functioning. So it was the scientific curiosity that we started a study in 88 in Holland uh, with a total of 344 consecutive patients who survived a cardiac arrest. And 18% of those patients reported the near-death experience with all the classical elements we know. And then we wanted to know if there was an explanation for the cause and content of this exceptional experiences in consciousness. And to our big surprise, we found that when we compared the group of 18% who reported the near-death experience and compared it with the group of 82% who did not have memories of this period of unconsciousness, there was no difference at all. So the duration of a uh, cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, or the duration of unconsciousness, uh, five minutes or three weeks in coma, or the given medication, or uh, foreknowledge, that you know that these kinds of experiences are possible, or um, fear of death, sorry, psychological causes, or religion, education, gender, it didn't make any difference. So the important conclusion was that it is a mystery why those patients experience an enhanced consciousness during cardiac arrest. And this was important because there had been so many theories based on retrospective studies that this experience should be caused by lack of oxygen to the brain, or that just were hallucinations, or uh, side effects of drugs, or, or just uh, trying to be interesting or something. Just they made up stories. And we were, could prove for the first time, we, this is still the, the largest study ever done, prospective study on the death experiences, that there is no physiological or psychological or pharmacological explanation for the study. And the second part of the study we did was a longitudinal study. That is, interviews after two years and eight years of all those patients who survived the cardiac arrest who had a near-death experience with a mass control group of patients who survived the cardiac arrest but did not have any memories. And we did it because people tell that they change. And this is the kind of objective aspect of this subjective experience. And we wanted to know if this transformation of those patients was due to the cardiac arrest itself or due to the near-death experience. And what we found that there was a specific transformation only for patients who have a near-death experience. They lose the fear of death. There's both no death. I was still there. They have a new insight in what is in important in life. It's about love. It's about acceptance. First to start with, with your own negative aspect, which is hard enough, and then love, unconditional love towards others and to planet Earth. And the third aspect of transformation is to enhance intuitive sensibility, which you can call the non-local information exchange. They have instantaneously contact with the feelings of other people. They know future events, they know when, when someone will, will die, and that is uh, so hard to accept this kind of information which you receive not by your senses or not by your body. It's the non-local information. And so the essence, what we learned from these studies of Nedeth, which was published in The Lancet in 2001, 
it's one of the most important medical journals, uh, that uh, people experience consciousness in a dimension where time and place and space plays no, play no role anymore. There's everything is there. The past, the present, and the future is enclosed in this dimension of consciousness. And in the dimension is unconditional love and, and wisdom. And in this dimension, normally we have here in this physical world a subject-object, but there is only subject. Everything is connected instantaneously. So the concept that uh, the, the, the content, the content of where patients talk about in their consciousness is, is an analogy from the concept we know from quantum mechanics. Everything is instantaneously interconnected. There's no time, no space. And when they are back in the body, which, which, is, which can be a conscious return into the body, which is awful for them, uh, then they still have this feeling of unity with others, with nature, with the endangered planet Earth. So that's what this, this has changed. The most important aspect as well is that we know that in cardiac arrest there's no function of the brain anymore. So the, the, the clinical death, which is called the period of unconsciousness when the, the heart doesn't function anymore and the breathing stops, you will die within five to ten minutes if there is no CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation started. All patients will die. So it's the process of dying where they in. And we know that the clinical findings in those patients are that they have no body reflexes anymore. That's the function of the cortex of the brain. There are no brainstem reflexes anymore. So no gag reflex, no corneal reflex, and wide dilated pupils. There's no breathing anymore. The breathing center is close to the brainstem. And when you measure the electrical activity of the brain, after an average of 15 seconds, it's a flat line. And the average time needed to resuscitate patients is at least 60 to 120 seconds or more. So all those patients in our study, in all the other prospective studies, or survivors of cardiac arrest must have had a flatline EG in a non-functioning brain. And in this very moment, they had an enhanced consciousness. So the challenge to concept, this never proven assumption that consciousness is a product of the function of the brain, it cannot be true. And that's an important conclusion. First of all, what we can measure with modern techniques for neuroscience, the fMRI, the PET scan, the EEG, is this measuring changing of activities in the brain. The fMRI gives changes of blood flow, PET scan gives changes in chemical activity of the brain. We cannot measure what we feel and what we think. We cannot measure the content of consciousness. We just can measure activation which is the use of structures. That's the only thing we can measure. Uh, I compare it sometimes with gravitation. We can measure the physical effects of gravitation, but we cannot measure the gravitational forces. We don't know what it is, because it's in a higher dimension. And also the non-local consciousness, we cannot measure directly, because it's in a higher dimension. So it's impossible to measure it. So. And then when you have a cardiac arrest, what I told you, you see the first changes of ischemia, lack of oxygen, after an average of 6.5 seconds, and an average of 15 seconds, it's a flat line. Well, the study Rupert mentioned is when you have patients who are in coma, uh, a bit on artificial respiration, not brain death, and it seems hopeless, then, and and the family gives permission to do the non-beating heart donation, which is that you stop 
everything you give them, medication and artificial respiration, you put them into the operation room and wait until they die. It can take 24 hours and sometimes three hours. And then as soon as the heart stops, they start looking in the watch and then after five minutes, body goes open, take everything out. And these kind of patients, they have made this registration of the EEG. And this is a normal process of dying, which is that breathing goes slower and slower. The heart rate is going slower and slower. The, the QRS complex of the EEG is going is widening. So it's, and then at last it stops and then comes back and stops. It's a totally different kind of process of dying and then cardiac arrest. And we know when cardiac arrest, that it is a flat line of 15, se 15 seconds. Secondly, when you have an out-of-body experience during a uh, near-death experience, then they, people can have theoretical perceptions which you can corroborate. And then they can describe things that happens like after 20 minutes or 30 minutes of the start of cardiac arrest. And they have sometimes perception. They are sent back to go to the body by a deceased relative. And they're back in the body and say, oh, I don't want to. And they see their own body and they see the nurse coming there, giving the defibrillation. And then they are forced to go back. That is the end of the resuscitation. Well, that is after minutes and minutes. And then there is no brain activity at all. When we try to find out what is the correlation of this terminal activity, but you can measure sometimes in the brain when there is a natural way of dying, which is a slow process. The whole process of dying takes hours to days until each information, uh, life and consciousness has gone out of the body. But um, sometimes patients who are, have dementia and don't recognize the family anymore for years and years, at once they have a normal waking consciousness. They recognize everybody, call their names, say thank you and goodbye and die. This is called terminal lucidity. You also have it in patients who have been uh, schizophrenic for years and years, just had psychosis and psychosis, and then at once they have a clear consciousness, recognize everybody, say goodbye and die. So this terminal lucidity could be correlated with this terminal activity in the brain. But I don't know. But it's not about near-death experiences because that's an enhanced consciousness at the moment that the brain doesn't function anymore in this study we did in cardiac arrest patients. In my concept, the brain does not produce consciousness, but it facilitates consciousness. It makes it possible to experience our waking consciousness. That's the consciousness we normally have during when we awake. And we can ask the question, where is our consciousness when we are asleep? Where are we when we are asleep? So we don't experience consciousness. Well, the brain is still functioning. We have a functioning brain when you are asleep. So um, when the instrument, but let's say when the brain is the interface, the brain functions as a transceiver. It receives information from the non-local consciousness. Consciousness is in a non-local space where, where no time, no space is available. And um, it receives information from consciousness and it sends information from body and senses into consciousness. So the brain serves as a transceiver. And when this instrument, this brain, has been damaged by dementia, Alzheimer, then it's not possible to receive the information as it is from this non-local consciousness. So the waking consciousness will be disturbed, but your real, real consciousness is always there, but you cannot express it. Like when you're asleep, like when you're in coma, when like you're in general anesthesia. And there, so also people who had um, uh, cardiac arrest or complicated during um, an operation, during general anesthesia, can have a near-death experience. And it is impossible because the brain doesn't, fu doesn't function in general anesthesia. 
you can have it in coma. And people can tell later when they regain consciousness after weeks or months of coma what has been told and done in the ICU. So there is consciousness, but in coma you cannot express what you know, what you feel, what you see. So you need a functioning brain to express your, your consciousness, which is just a part of this non-local consciousness. So the, the, the consciousness is not just in the brain. It's everywhere. It's not localized in the brain, but you experience your waking consciousness when your brain is functioning. Well, space-time is for me more the physical world and the non-local dimension where, in my opinion, consciousness is because there's no time, no space, everything is connected. Uh, uh, then th th there's no time, no space. And uh, the concept of Schubert Hameroff with Penrose is that the, the mercury tubules could be some place where consciousness comes from or comes out. Um, I believe that not only the brain but the whole body and each cell is connected with consciousness. And the DNA in each cell could be the interface function for consciousness as well. Consciousness is not just uh, in or experienced by the brain. There are different kinds of consciousness. We should call it perhaps unconsciousness. But there is information coming from the other dimension into our body. When you realize that each second 250,000 cells die, each day 50 billion cells die in your body and are replaced, and each year your body is new. There's always a continuity of your function of your body. So there is an exchange of information which must be faster than light. And if you realize that molecules and atoms are replaced each 10 days at submolecular levels, it's, <laughs> it's, it's 10 to the minus 20 or, 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 or 30. So it's incredible. It's, there's no stability in our body. We, we, we perceive it as stability, but there's no stability. It's always, always changing. And consciousness is the only thing which is always there. The waking consciousness is a kind of complementary aspect of the non-local consciousness. It's both. It's both. So uh, people with the need ethics tell us that death it's just the death of the physical aspects, but the essence is still there. And, and, and death, like birth, is just a changing state of consciousness. It's always there. But it's now experienced without a body. Someone wrote me, I can live without my body, but my body cannot live without me. It dies. <laughs> you, need, you need life in your body <laughs> to be in there and to experience your waking consciousness. because it's just the experience we have and we know that as a living uh, uh, person we experience consciousness and uh, in my opinion consciousness is fundamental in the universe and everything we experience also the material aspects of the universe come from our consciousness so everything has a kind of not the human consciousness but animals plants and even planet Earth, so we'll have some kind of subjectivity, which is not the consciousness we have, but it is a kind of consciousness everywhere in the universe. It's fundamental for me. There's nothing new under the sun, because in all times, in all cultures, in all religions, this has been said before. It is written down. Plato has written about the near-death experience. When you read the Upanishads, the Hinduism, the Tibetan Buddhism, the Kabbalah, uh, Plato, uh, in medieval times, all the, what were called the mystical experiences, it has always been said and written down. 
And because of the modern techniques of resuscitation, we have more and more patients who survive cardiac arrest and will tell us this old wisdom. It has been there always. And, and there, must be, there have been uh, polls, in, uh, at random polls, in the United States and Germany, which found that about 4% of the general population in the Western world should have had an NDE, which is 9 million people in the United States must have had an NDE, but most are silent because it's not accepted by their partner, more than 50% defaults, not a, a, a accepted by the family and friends, not accepted by the doctors, by the nurses. So they're very isolated. It, it's, the, the experience is wonderful, but the acceptance is so low. They have, they have years and years of depression, homesickness, um, loneliness. Because they cannot, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, lonely. Because they cannot share their experience with others. Because it's not accepted. So, for them, they have first tried to accept this this overwhelming experience, which they can hardly accept themselves. I have, I know some doctors who had in this experience. They said, "What I have experienced now, I've always said, said this is impossible. Now I've had it myself." So, and then the second step is to integrate it in your life. That means that you are going to live according to the new uh, life insight. And that takes years and years and years. I don't know exactly how it works. I don't believe that what we call our ego, our waking consciousness, will come back. I think also our waking consciousness our ego, is just an aspect of a higher aspect, perhaps self, uh, which already has some aspects in a, in a physical body again and again. Um, I don't know. Even if we know that you can have access to memories. What we hear from people with a death experience is that each thought you ever had is kept with the influence it had on yourself and others in the past. Each thought is kept, and then of course each word and, and action is kept as well. But um, So if you have access because of the interconnectedness with thoughts from people who have lived, you can have access to the deceased relatives and you have thought transfer with them. Then we have access to someone who had lived 100 years ago. You don't know if you have access to thoughts of someone lived there or that was an aspect of high aspects of yourself, I don't know. But it is possible to experience again something in your life, in your body. That's possible. It's an experience of oneness. It's, it's unity. Everything is connected. And when they come back, they have still this kind of it is the non-local information exchange. It is the enhanced intuitive sensibility. You are connected. So they, they, they have an inner knowing about it. It's not by the ratio, but by the inner knowing that they know everything is connected. And this is non-dual. This is unity. This is oneness. Well, I, I've written a book recently. Um, in Holland, which was a bestseller, with more than 100,000 copies sold within one year. It was nominated for the Book of the Year of 2008. It is, it, it's, with this kind of subject, it's, it's quite remarkable. But uh, people gave it to friends who are, were dying. People gave it to their parents who were very old. They use it in hospices, terminal care, palliative care, but also for philosophers, psychologists. Uh, medical students. Uh, so a, a, a lecture all over the world now. Um, it has been published in Germany now and now recently uh, in the United States. Uh, Consciousness Beyond Life. When you know that uh, there's no death, there's a continuity of the essence of who you are, you live different. So uh, the concept you have about death uh, makes how you live. So the, the, the material 
excel aspects of life, uh, competition, money, big car, young, young body, etc. It isn't important anymore. It's about uh, empathy, compassion towards others, towards the planet Earth. So uh, it changes a lot. So we need them, those people that need that experience. <laughs> yeah, we can learn from them. From them. Yeah. I will say they were my teachers. I was just a materialistic cardiologist. And it's just because of my, my uh, curiosity, I started to do this study. And it changed my concepts about life and death. Thank you.